the more things change, the more they remain the same. And no shipper is omniscient. They, if they were, they would do everything by the slowest and cheapest mode of transport possible because everybody in business manages to a budget. This is the Time on Wing podcast episode 13, lucky number 13. This is the podcast where we talk about aviation professionals, their paths, their time on wing in the industry. Garrick, who are we discussing today? So today, um, we are actually talking to Tom Crabtree. And uh, for those of you who don't know Tom, Tom is currently the managing director of Trade and Transport Group, and they focus on freighters on the freighter market, which is going to be pretty exciting. There's a lot of stuff going on, so it's going to be great to talk to him today. Uh, so Tom has got an illustrious career at Boeing. But for those of you that have been uh, at Boeing several times, you will probably have seen his work. Um, so he was actually regional director of airline market analysis at Boeing for 25 years. He was also a contributing author and chief editor of the Boeing World Air Cargo Forecast. He's another forecaster, um, as are beloved uh, Courtney Miller over here, and uh, he does go to, uh, you know, forecasts as anonymous groups as well, just to make sure that they take care of their problems. But before that, um, so Tom had sort of various roles in uh, Boeing as uh, self support engineering, flight operations engineering, marketing positions at Boeing. Uh, he also has a Bachelor of Science in Aerospace Engineering and an MBA from the University of Kansas. And he also has a certification in Russian Technical Language Translation from some new state university that I cannot pronounce, but I'm sure he can uh, let us know where that's from. So it's going to be great to, to talk to him about uh, all the things Freighter today and, and also his career at Boeing. So Tom, this is your time on Wing. So Tom, thanks again for being with us today. Uh, we can't wait to kind of Fair chat way. with you and hear about your background um, you know, one of the things that we do here on the show is obviously we'd, we'd love to hear kind of how you got your start uh, in aviation, where the passion came from. So um, why don't we uh, start from there? Well, uh, I think it was a couple of things. Uh, my father used to drag me to military air shows uh, about uh, 10, 15 miles from where we lived in uh, suburban Kansas City, Missouri, uh, at an Air Force base that's uh, now long since closed. Um, he was a big airplane aficionado, I should say, and still is. Uh, but I think I, I got it, the bug to a much greater degree. And um, I think it really took off when I was in, I want to say, junior high. Took off, see? Uh, yeah. yeah, the, the pun You're intended. Right. Yeah, it is, it um, is ingrained. <laughs> so so um, when I was in junior high, a book came out uh, on the story of Victor Belenko who was a MiG-25 pilot for the Soviet Air Force based at an Air Force base about 120 miles, and I had to look this up this morning, about 120 miles south of Vladivostok. And in September 1976, he decided to take his MiG-25 and defected to Japan. Um, and that book uh, was published in, yeah, I was going to say roughly late 1980. Uh, I would have been in eighth grade at the time. And... Um, I couldn't get my nose out of that book. It was a fascinating story. And to a society that was long closed to Westerners uh, since World War II. And uh, I learned a lot about the MiG-25 uh, because there was a lot of, I should say, apprehension in the West over uh, Soviet achievements in aerospace. And rightly so. They did some really good things. Uh, but the airplane was not invincible. Um, there was a lot of American speculation that the aircraft was stolen technology based on the A-5 Vigilante, which it was not. It was an airplane designed to kill the uh, XB-70, which was never built in mass production. Only two uh, prototypes were built, and one was destroyed in testing, and the other is now at the Museum of the United States Air Force in Dayton, Ohio. So I, I just, uh, by the time I finished high school, I wanted to be an aerospace engineer. I wanted to design combat aircraft. I wanted to be uh, conversant in all things uh, military aircraft, and by the time I finished, 1990, in my undergraduate, uh, the defense buildup under Ronald Reagan was being wound down very quickly, and there were very few jobs. So I went back to school. I studied Russian. I studied uh, business. And uh, Boeing hired me as an intern in 1991 to build brochures for a trip to visit the Soviet Union. 
uh, which was scheduled for the same week there was a coup uh, in Moscow in the August of 1991. Good timing. So, gosh, that'd be 32 years ago. So you, so you, what yeah, you just did years like ago this very week? You did like a replace all in the brochure, just replaced Soviet Union with Russia, and still went with it, right? Um, you got to, Cordy, uh, you got to understand there was no such thing as replace all software of that era. <laughs> <laughs> it's more like backspace, 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 right? <laughs> and, and, and being and being an intern just in graduate school at the time, um, I wasn't I wasn't anywhere I wasn't allowed anywhere near the customer. Um, I was building brochures for uh, the big bosses that were planning to head over to Moscow, and their trip got scrubbed uh, the same week I was packing up my uh, my apartment to move back to uh, to go back to college and finish up my last finish off my last year of graduate yeah. school. Um, and then I was rehired full-time in the summer of 1992. So um, I did um, yeah, a number of stints in um, what was called sales support engineering uh, on the 747, 767 program. I was um, a focal for developing the brochures for what became the 767-300 freighter when it was launched by an order from UPS in January of 1993. And what's amazing is that uh, that aircraft first delivered in October of 1995. And besides a bit of a flight deck update and some aerodynamic, minor aerodynamic upgrades, that airplane is still being built in Everett, Washington, 27, 28 years later. It's amazing. Yeah. Wow. Now, so, is that is that um, where you got the kind of the, the freighter bug? Uh, yeah. To a degree, yeah. I, I found out there was a bunch of guys. Um, so I was based in Everett. And as you know, there's like, two big camps with, within Boeing and the greater Seattle. There's Everett where all the wide bodies historically were built. And there's Renton, which the people in Everett used to call the kite factory since they only build, you know, small airplanes, like, you know, standard bodies. Kite factory. So shots fired. Um, with, oh yeah. <laughs> you talk about, uh, tribalism knows no bounds, even within Boeing. But, um, uh, there was a team of folks building the, uh, Boeing World Air Cargo forecast, and somebody left a straight paper copy in uh, at one of our Everett offices, and I nicked it. And uh, this sounds really geeky, but I took it home and read it in my fair, spare time. So, um, and I didn't realize, but like four years later, I was doing cost modeling for Boeing Marketing, uh, what's was called what they call airline economics, and um, was asked to join the the cargo team because they kept losing people, and um, I was going to do it for maybe a year ended up being 25 wow. years that's yeah. how things that's happen great. in this industry yeah 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 i know it you just got to catch on that little uh, niche area that you really like and that's it right you just kind of decide to go in that direction yeah. so wow 25 years that's awesome yeah it's uh yeah boeing was very good to me 25 so yeah, that, um wait a minute 25 so this was in the late 90s when you joined the, the cargo side um yeah 1996 um Right at like December of that, yeah, right at the end of that year. Yeah, that's fa so okay. So uh -huh. yeah, so the the seven six three was launched. The freighter was launched in ninety six. You said uh, no. Um, the program kickoff was the order from UPS in I believe January or February nineteen ninety. Oh yeah, the program. I see. I see. And then the first airplane delivered in in yeah. ninety six. First delivery was in October of ninety five. Yeah, which is actually pretty quick, right? I mean. I guess it's not a brand new airplane, right? But it's it's, it's a not hard. He just cut a hole in the side. It's not hard. Yeah, just got to cut a door. That's right. Just cut some stuff. Put some yeah, panels on the floor. How hard can it be? That's it. <laughs> well, to be okay. Well, it's funny you should bring that up, and we can if we want to get into the rabbit uh -huh. trails. This early in the conversation, happy to do so. Uh -huh. That's happy exactly. So. Yeah, it's but, exactly what we do. Here. Um, I was also part of the uh, the teams that. Um, helped launch uh, the triple seven freighter and the seven four seven dash eight freighter in the same year. Oh, right. In 2005, the triple seven freighter was launched by air France cargo in May of 2005. And then that November, 2005, uh, both cargo Lux and Nippon cargo airlines of Japan launched the seven four seven dash eight. So Boeing went really big on a bet on not one, but two large wide body freighter programs within six months. Um, the 777, though, launched that year, and a lot of preliminary work had already been scoped uh, within Boeing up to the program launch in the spring of 90, or spring of 2005, excuse me. Um, the, the developmental program ran until, I believe it was 
yeah, the first delivery was in February 2009 to Air France. So it uh, took a little bit longer. What was... Mm. So I'm thinking of the lineage of the of the triple seven in terms of so there was the 200 the 200 ER and then it was the 300 right yeah that mm-hmm. was in the early 2000s non ER which the non ER then the uh, ER the first three but yeah, then the, it was the freighter from that so no so um first yeah 1995 Boeing delivered the first 777 200 non-ER to United Airlines that was I want to say still flying June, July better but yeah and then um 200 ER came uh more or less I want to say 1997 98 mm-hmm. somewhere in that then one of those two years and then um they stretched the airplane to build the 300 based on the original uh, wing box landing gear uh, weight capabilities of the 200, 200 ER. And uh, that was sold in limited quantities almost exclusively for intra-Asian operation by, say, the likes of Cathay, Singapore, just to name. Uh, Thai, I think, was another operator. Um, but to make that airplane a true 747-400 PAX replacement, it needed a lot more oomph. Mm-hmm. And GE uh, negotiated sole source on the GE90 uh, for the triple seven 300 er and 200 lr which is have essentially the same wing box same landing gear um and fuselage strengthening uh to allow long-range intercontinental flight and then uh, i'm gonna expose my own ignorance here but the freighter is based on that wing box as well is that right okay correct yeah yeah on the the look the uh, two of the 300 er 200 lr um wing box That's did the correct. freighter come after the lr Yes, it oh, did. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I did get those that. backwards there. Yeah. Okay. The, yeah. Yeah. The, the, the freighter, uh, again, uh, the, so the 200LR and 300ER were developed in the early first five years of this century. Um, and I, I can't remember exactly when the 200LR del- first delivered, but I want to say it's somewhere between 2006 and 2008. And the freighter wasn't delivered till 2009. Okay. Very cool. So, yeah. so you designed an entire freighter all, all by yourself. Three. Well done. Three. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. That, that's that's the answer of somebody yeah. that doesn't want to be blamed for anything. Yeah. No, no, no. We had a team of people. A Plausible team. deniability. Yeah. Plausible deniability. That's right. I, yeah. I was a small cog in the whole piece. Yeah. 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 Uh, nice. So, um, but it was a. It, yeah. The. Uh, right, any of the um, so you're talking about the the factory freighter programs. Do you have any experience or or what are your what's your level of interaction with say some of the conversion programs? I mean, did you get involved in that as well? Uh, well, being the you know one of the several folks that followed the market, uh, we were pinged for what we thought would be the market potential for any number of developmental programs uh, that were that were brought to fruition some that weren't for example um we were asked to help out and scope the business case for the 747 400 conversion which became the 4 747 400 bcf which was competing with um, ii's bdsf on the 74 400 so i got to know like say rafi madelon at iii fairly well through trade shows um and um yeah so and the same thing that that also ex- transpired to the triple seven three hundred ER uh, conversion programs, which Boeing ultimately uh, decided not to do, and probably in my opinion wisely so because already that market has no less than three non OEM conversion houses chasing that feedstock. So you, uh, II launched their program in the fourth quarter of twenty nineteen, um, Mammoth and. Uh, Kansas Modification Center or KMOD came in late 2020 or mid 2021, if memory serves me right. So, um, and all three are um, in development phases, trying to get their their STC approved in a very challenging environment, um, given the limited resources of the FAA and EASA. Yeah, definitely very tough. Um, so, I, I have a question for you on the. So, obviously, you're. I'm trying to think the. When you were doing the forecast, was it every other year that the for, or is it every year that you you put out the forecast? Well, it was uh, 
by the time I joined the team in the late nineties, it was every other year simply because it was such a massive effort. Yeah. Uh, the data resources required to build that, um, are that to build that, uh, to build any kind of a forecast of any great detail in the freight industry, uh, require a lot of scrounging from sources, from folks that, um, aren't necessarily on the beaten path. Uh, data is much more readily available in the passenger side of commercial air transport. Uh, but we as a, as a air cargo market analysis team at Boeing had to, we had to understand what was going in the PAX market because so much of air freight is carried in PAX bellies. So um, we had to be jacks of all trade. Uh, it was, it's, it was it's a lot of hoops to jump through. So yeah, we, we would basically do the forecast every other year uh, because if we were doing it, well, we really struggled to justify doing it every year with the limited resources we had. Yeah. <clears throat> and because I, I, I could imagine that it's doing a, a 20 year forecast has got, I mean, I, I don't know if you had the same questions when, uh, when you were still with Boeing in terms of, I know, you know, obviously putting a value forecast on airplanes, people always kind of go, Hey, look, you know, do you <clears throat> go back and look to see where you forecast, what, what you were forecasting, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago and see how well you did or didn't do or, um, and so, you know, I think to me, kind of when I look at a, a 20 year forecast, right, there's, it's such a long time frame that it's challenging to kind of, well, you know, how, how do you, how do you get it somewhat correct? And so, so what were from your standpoint, having done it for, you know, close to 25 years or being part of it, like what, what were your biggest challenges when you're looking at that? Well, the hard part was the traffic growth rate, um, which uh, one of the questions you asked me before joining the podcast was what one of the biggest changes you saw in the in the, the cargo industry in my career. One of which was the deceleration in growth rates. Uh, up until roughly 2001, 2002, uh, the 20 year CAGR on the on the ton kilometer or ton mile growth rate for the industry worldwide was somewhere north of 6%. And basically, we had no evidence at that time that things were going to change. China was joining the World Trade Organization in 2001 um, in the summer of that year, and things looked really rosy going forward. And um, I do remember I was responsible for the transatlantic forecast, which was exhibiting signs of weakness as far back as like 1996, 97. So I started lowering the forecast from roughly six and a half down to six. And I got, because of that, before the document was even published, I was called into a vice president's office as to why I was monkeying. Yeah, I'd say, you just wiped out billions. But <laughs> I pretty much was saying, we cannot defend as a company saying anything higher than what I'm predicting now. And even that number proved to be optimistic. Now, that market is growing on a, in a long-term growth rate of, say, 2 or 3% per year on average. And actually, the air freight is very volatile much more volatile than mm -hmm. tax growth rates mm -hmm. because unlike those of us who travel by airplane for either work or going to see friends and family, um, shippers have choice. Uh, and at that time with the rise quote unquote of globalization, the container ship industry was on a huge ass tear. It was growing by leaps and bounds. Uh, low double digit CAGR growth rates uh, somewhere between 10 and 15% was not uncommon between roughly uh, I would say the late 1980s and roughly 2008, 2009 during the time of the great financial crisis, but things have started to change. You know, I can talk about that more later if you wish, but what we did notice is that with at that time also track and trace was being rolled out by the first, it was the likes of say FedEx and UPS, but as it technology got more uh, affordable telecommunication costs came down the shipper need for how should I say the certainty of air freight seemed to diminish uh, as a consequence and people think oh I, why do shippers buy air freight oh it's for speed no not at all what they do buy it for is for reliability that's mm -hmm. what we found out over the course of time and um, I, I became good friends with uh, a couple of folks that were running a consultancy in uh, suburban Washington, D.C., uh, namely Brian Clancy and David Hoppen at Merge Global. 
And they had done a lot of research and they corroborated the same thing we were saying. It was not speed that shippers wanted when they bought air freight services, which are extremely expensive, but they were buying reliability to protect themselves. And before the advent of track and trace and ample surface uh, volumes on the container ship side, air freight growth rates were more in alignment with expanding, burgeoning international trade links. And then as things started mm -hmm. to settle down, shippers would move product out of air into container ships because they, they could predict when they needed it and the shelf life oftentimes didn't need the speed that air freight would provide and the, the expense wouldn't justify it in terms of the overall cost of whatever uh, merchandise good you were moving, whether it be a widget or cut flowers, fast fashion, capital goods, that sort of thing. The I'm fascinated by the, uh, you call it reliability. So I spent a couple years at DHL um, uh, and the, and the, on the network planning side and the value we found, of course, speed is express business. So there's always the value of speed, but the value we found was security. Yeah. Uh, shippers, uh, the amount of uh, just hijacking and piracy um, that takes place just, you wouldn't even know it, in the domestic US, right? We would have entire truckloads of material lost somewhere. And then they would find the trailer backed up somewhere and they had gone through all the stuff and pulled out and they knew exactly which trucks, you know, um, you know, had computers like laptops and stuff. They would just be, they'd wait outside the Dell factory and, and pull the truck over or, uh, like jewelry. So like distributing jewelry to department stores, they didn't need the speed. They needed the security, yeah. um, which, yeah. Again, not not key or like like you were talking about, you know, traceability, um, actually tracking everywhere that this has gone through or customs integration was always was always one. Uh, but I can imagine this was what I find fascinating about what you're talking about here is in the 90s that it sounds like it was even more of a differentiator yeah. that kind of decayed over time. Is that right? So the value of the value of that premium for air product kind of diminished as the other modes of transportation caught up reliably and, and security wise. Yes, that that's my that's my judgmental opinion and um, conversations Makes with sense. other folks who've looked at this these industries over a very long period of time tend to agree with me. Um, yeah. That being said. Um, it is painful to go back and look at some of my old forecasts from the late 90s or early part of the century uh, that I participated in and realize none of that came true. Well, I should take that back. A lot of it did not come true. Um, uh, there's a journalist um, uh, who used to write for Air Cargo Week whose name escapes me. I really feel awful. Not, not Air Cargo Week, Air Cargo News of the United Kingdom uh, asked me to do an interview while I was at Boeing, and this would have been the 2012-2013 time frame, um, to talk about uh, past forecast versus what had been unfolding up to that point in time. And um, so I, I did a, quite a bit of homework on it, and what Boeing did get right, which was the name of the article when it was published, um, was that the demand for large wide bodies uh, over time uh, became kind of a safety valve for the world container ship industry, bridging the main trade lanes between East Asia, North America, East Asia, and Europe. Um, North-South lanes are fairly de minimis. The biggest trade lanes in our in, in the air cargo industry are the Trans-Pacific in terms of goods put on put on aircraft multiplied by the distance flown. So, ton miles, furlongs per fortnight. You pick the metric. Uh, and then Ooh, I like that furlongs yeah, per fortnight. Let's yeah, that, that was one. an aerospace engineer, uh, engineering professor, <laughs> nearly forty years ago, taught me that one. Um, and then, um, and then East Asia to and from Europe is the second biggest market. And um, what's interesting is that at, by that time, and this was kind of critical by by the 2011, 2012, 2013 time frame, the 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 pernicious effects of the great uh, financial crisis of 2008-2009, which was the biggest economic calamity since the Great Depression. A lot of people didn't realize that. I was studying maritime trade patterns 
uh, from a book that was published by a guy named Martin Stopford, who's one of the leading authorities on uh, trade in the world. And um, he uh, published a book called Maritime Economics. And in it, he had a chart uh, that documented, based on old Lloyd's records, uh, what happened to international trade on ocean-going vessels between roughly what he called the interwar period between roughly 1920 and 1939. And uh, what we were seeing was pretty, pretty, pretty awful in the 2008-2009 time frame. But it took a while for the effects. There was a there was a fall off and there was a big, what they called a bullwhip effect, where cargo just went crazy in the autumn of 2009. Because a lot of manufacturers had not banked on the fact that more than 80% of us still had our day jobs. We were still buying stuff like for homes and kids and whatnot. And as a consequence, they had over-rotated, another aviation pun, uh, they had over-rotated to pulling a supply chain and manufacturing capacity back to the point that things were just, it was just chaos. And shipping, uh, basically, uh, air, all cargo airlines could basically name their price by the fall of 2009. And this, this boom went on through 2010, but then that fell off. And then what set in thereafter in the air cargo industry was called the great stagnation. Between 2011 and 2013, air cargo for three years hardly grew at all. There was talk of, you would pick up a number of aviation concerns. It was even in um, The Economist. Um, Freighter aircraft basically are no longer needed. Passenger bellies can take care of the entire mm. industry. Uh, nothing could have been further from the truth because uh, the majority of air cargo is still carried on freighters, even in that time frame. But I will say that there was leadership of an OAM that called a little analyst on the carpet said, what were you telling us back in 2005 to plow X billion dollars into developing two large wide body freighter programs? Um, and, uh, yeah, let's just to say so I learned to minute, dance. You... I learned to dance and and talk very fast. <laughs> yeah, you worked at an OEM. I'm sure you did. That's how you lasted so long. Um, but w- wait a minute. So you are you being the people that are calling you to the carpet are giving me crap for a two year period for which a forecast I gave over a forty year program. Like wait till there's a global pandemic. Just, just, just hang tight. That's right. Yeah. Oh, um, it's coming. <laughs> it's coming. Yeah. And, but uh, I, so Tom, when I, I'm, I totally geek out on this uh, um, because I'm, I'm thoroughly fascinated by, you know, th- so much of the the metrics that you're, you're not kind of mentioning, um, mostly because it's probably too geeky for most normal people, but, um, but not for me. Um, because w- one of the metrics that I kind of hear in there is inventories, like the, the number of mm-hmm. the amount of, uh, inventory in warehouses and these just in time supply chain systems, which again, finally, not finally, but you know, the term supply chain is now like a key word that people have heard back then it was nothing, right. Unless you were in the, the logistics industry. Um, right. But the, you know, shifting to just in time, the number of in- inventories that must have been around the bullwhip effect. I mean, these are all things that, you know, you're talking about in context of, you know, 2008, nine in through 13 that were, again, living almost identically. And I'm I'm speaking out of turn on that, but very similarly today. Yes. Yeah. The more things change, the more they remain the same. And. Um, no shipper is, is omniscient. They, if they were, they would do everything by the slowest and cheapest mode of transport possible because everybody in business manages to a budget. And I think that needs to be kept in mind. Um, so there, as I was trying to point out earlier, and I think I failed to mention is that when it comes to moving people, uh, long distances greater than say driving distances of say 500 miles, airplanes are pretty much our choice. At one time in, you know, the domestic North America market, you could take a train or a bus. Um, But the air transport industry has really changed our civilization that most Mm -hmm. of people our age and younger have no idea how much the world changed. changed. So, for example, like if you wanted to go to Europe 60 years ago, most people could afford it only by, say, taking a boat from North America. Um, In fact, uh, 
I don't, you probably are aware of that. I believe it was, I'm probably saying this incorrect. I'm pronouncing this brand name Cunard mm-hmm. shipping line. Oh yeah. Out yeah. of, out of the UK, out of, out of England at the time, actually co-branded with BOAC in the early sixties to help, uh, stabilize the, the, the annihilation of their business model. The good old fashioned co-chair, uh, the original, the original right? co-chair. Yeah. You know, connect times so, are like three days. But, but what's interesting is, is that, um, air freight has lots of competition. It's a niche industry. Mm-hmm. It's a niche industry on two different levels. It's a niche industry within commercial air transport. So, um, but it's also a niche industry within overall freight transportation. Uh, but it's a very powerful niche and that's it. People need it just because unexpected things happen or they have a merchandise item of some value that requires air transportation. What's also lost on a lot of people, especially in commercial air transport, people that are kind of lay people to air freight is they think, um, oh, air freight's, uh, nothing but small parcels and documents in my e-commerce, uh, it would be uh, nice. Purchases. Mm, no, no. Somewhere, um, we speculate at Trade and Transport Group that we speculate. We we have evidence that points to the fact that probably 60% of international air trade is in support of a manufacturing operation. Uh, one 60% anecdote I used to give. By, is this by weight or volume or? By weight, yeah. Yeah, roughly. fair enough. Uh, for example, um, I was asked... Uh, by a good friend of mine uh, who used to run Emirates Sky Cargo, Ram Menon. Um, and uh, he's now retired and living in Europe. Um, but uh, when he was running Emirates, which became, you know, a huge powerhouse in air cargo uh, over the period roughly 1985 till roughly about a decade ago, um, how much of air cargo uh, was dependent on automobile manufacturing? And the best calculation I came up with at that time, this was like right around the, the great financial crisis. So this would, these stats would have been based on 2007 or 2008 data. It's about 10% of air cargo was automotive components or pieces, parts, or capital equipment used to build uh, small vehicles and light trucks, that sort of thing. And... Um, um, there's a, a book called Moving Boxes that was published by Peter Morris of Cranfield mm-hmm. University. And uh, a good friend of mine, um, Thomas Klein, who is uh, now works at Cargo Lux, uh, became a contributing author to a revised edition of that. And so he and I got to chatting. So he's been with Cargo Lux for a very long time. And uh, Thomas w- had, done some, had done some calculations based on Cargo Lux data and what little he could see from Luf- Lufthansa cargo operations out of Frankfurt is that cargo out of the side of a non-express sector tends to aggregate at the end of a week and shippers try to use the weekend and freighter aircraft as a warehouse in transit between two different manufacturing sites on two different parts of the planet. Hmm. So, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty fascinating stuff. Yeah. Now, that's, that's traditional air freight. Uh, I would be ris- remiss of not talking more about that E-word, e-commerce, which has been bantied about for the better part of a quarter century. Uh, I remember Fred Smith of FedEx in 1998 said, we are the airline of the internet and his stock just boomed that day, that day anyway. Uh, and I remember, um, uh, They've done Scott sense. Adams, the, uh, the, the author of, um, uh, the Dilbert cartoon series. Uh, one of my, my, my favorite anti heroes is Wally in the, uh, Dilbert series. And, um, Wally decided to put his what little hair he had in a ponytail, and venture capitalists started chasing him because they thought he was some sort of e-commerce <laughs> startup guru. Garrick, you should do that. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think I have anything back there to make any kind of a ponytail. Yeah, I could probably, I could probably I put one on front. top. Yeah, bloop. <laughs> but <laughs> it it took it took a while. Uh, you know, getting back on on topic here, but it took a while. But uh, Amazon standing up its own. Uh, distribution system, which is what it essentially runs within the U.S. Uh, the U.S. network. It doesn't. It isn't going international, at least not yet, with its seven six sevens and seven three seven freighters, and soon to be added a three thirty freighters. I believe. I think the first a three thirty three hundred P to F is added. I want to say fourth quarter of this I year. Think, yeah, if research so. me right. Th- those are Hawaiian but, Hawaiian yeah. operated, yeah. right? Is that but okay. it. It, it's not a traditional air freight system in, in the context that I have known through most of my career. It is an inventory management system. And 
Uh, my, my colleague at Train Transport Group, Frederick Horse, actually coined that term, not me. But it, it's apt because they are, at least not yet, are selling, they are not retailing their distribution system like DHL, FedEx, and UPS or... They tried. Uh, say SF in China, or SF, yeah. Yeah, they tried. So this is back, I wrote an article for the Air Current a couple years ago, basically spilling out what you're talking about, which is, uh, so you got to remember... Fred Smith said something that Bezos took offense to. So Bezos started Amazon Prime Air or whatever they called it before they changed it to the to the drones. And then uh, but Amazon is a warehouse to everywhere. FedEx is an everywhere to everywhere. And it changes everything when you have to pick up material from everywhere. And Amazon tried it. They gave it they in, in large metro areas and it did not last because you just can't. I mean, like it just it, it's a it's wholly different system. You you have to create a wholly different network to yeah. to accept from everywhere and deliver to everywhere that, by the way, FedEx, UPS, uh, SF, uh, DHL, they they do that. Amazon does not. They consolidate in a warehouse. They move to other fulfillment centers. Mm-hmm. And then they distribute from those fulfillment centers, um, but they do not pick up. In fact, if you try to return something, they'll just say keep it because <laughs> it's too yeah. much of an right. asshole. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, we yeah. all had that. But they're just kind of like, wait, what'd you buy? No, you can keep that. Yeah, we'll send you something else. Yeah, and 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 I think that's one of the big changes right now. And what's also interesting is that um, we take for granted in the developed world. So I read say. North America, Europe, Japan, South Korea, we take for granted, and to an, an extent, China, mainland China, uh, we take for granted that e-commerce is just part of our everyday lives now. What is not widely appreciated in the air transport sector, um, and there has been a downturn in terms of cargo traffic and yields have been falling uh, since uh, the ebbing of the chaos of, of there's that supply chain word again in 2021, um, is the fact that e-commerce has a lot of runway for growth ahead of it in the developing world. Um, We're seeing all kinds of queries um, from potential clients um, about how e-com were developed in their countries outside of those regions I just listed moments ago. So, um, and that is actually a a sphere of the industry that's if regionally um, is often served by medium wide body freighters or narrow body freighters. So um, large wide bodies play a role. Don't get me wrong, but most e-commerce in North America and Europe usually started out on a container ship moving from East Asia to those destinations. And then once it gets into you know, uh, that particular region, it moves by air as needed, or maybe it doesn't, it just yeah. gets trucked. Um, yeah, so the example I can think of that I love to talk about is Mercado Libre in Latin America, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. is the Amazon of Latin America, uh, really. is right. uh, India is another market that I'm just continuously infatuated with, which is the growth that's going on there. Is there is there a e-commerce uh, express operator in, in India, or is that kind of a market ripe for... There's a Disruption. there's a number of folks trying to to break into that market and um, QuickJet, which was an AOC that was uh, dormant for many many years, uh, was reactivated earlier this year and I forget who they are flying for me. I believe it's Amazon, but I could be wrong. Um, I believe Walmart bought up Flipkart, which was an e-com provider, uh, using a lot of other people's capacity within India. Um, What's interesting is that you have a couple of incumbent players, well, like Blue Dart has been there for decades. Um, they were the original India express carrier. Um, and they were once part of the FedEx, they were once affiliated with FedEx, but I think over a decade ago now, maybe closer to 15 years ago, um, basically they are the arm of DHL within India in terms of moving air product. But what's interesting is that the rise of Indigo and uh, most LLCs in the passenger side stay away from cargo, not Indigo. 
Not oh, interesting. Yeah. And it's not uncommon for them to get more than a metric ton per A3-2021 family departure of cargo in the in the lower hold. And a lot of it has to do with ample uh, labor to mm. load aircraft, bulk load those aircraft. Yeah, aircraft. this is all loose Although loaded I, stuff, I, right? To a degree. Um, I believe, though, I, I, I want to caveat that, though, um, is that so Indigo is now operating A321 PDFs um, regionally. And they are using the Airbus um, um, containerized uh, their containerized loading system in the belly. Notice I didn't say cargo. Notice I didn't say cargo. I said containerized loading yeah. system, which I believe was its original name. Um, there's not been a lot of uptake for that system in the A320 family, uh, but uh, for cargo, it, it makes a bit of sense, especially just as we talked about security being key. Uh, any point in the supply chain where stuff is laying out, if you're like moving, say, oh, I don't know, four boxes of Johnny Walker blue whis- uh, yeah, blend whiskey, uh, all of a sudden, uh, three show up at the destination. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> How do you move four, <laughs> four bottles of Johnny Walker whiskey? Well, you start with five. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, something like that. But I mean, um, but by and large, uh, yeah, most narrow body operators just use try to use the main deck as quickly as possible. Um, there are exceptions to that. I, I know a number of fleet planners. If they listen to this podcast, they're going to probably uh, send me a nasty gram by email or, or text. But um, by and large, uh, you see mostly on narrow body freighter operations, the main deck is your primary mode to load, and then whatever may fit in the lower hold will go. But um, dare I say it, Airbus may have put together a better mousetrap than Boeing with the um, CLA. We'll, we'll have to yeah. see. Yeah, it we'll depends. I, I think, I want to say Air Canada has some of those Airbuses with the with the belly load, the, the cargo. Loading system. The, yeah. the cargo belly, but it just doesn't. The containerized have, loading system? Yeah, you they're, lose they're, so much space. The prevalent for passenger, there's a there's a space loss, there is a tear weight increment, yeah. um, there's the infrastructure investment in terms yeah. of having loaders on site. Which is more weight. Uh, yeah. At all your network of, of airports. I mean, there's a number of challenges there. Um, and if you're an LLC and your, your primary mission is to move people as fast as possible, it's really hard to justify that. Case in point, uh, Wizz Air, Ryanair, um, EasyJet within Europe do not have a cargo department. They don't yeah. sell cargo, last I knew. And that may have changed, but that research is a few years old, but it just isn't in their DNA. But um, Fly Dubai, Air Arabia in the Middle East, yep, they sell they sell their lower holds. Yeah, well, I know that that's been one of the, really, the, yeah. the selling points with the, you know, the A321 uh, PDF in terms of, from the Airbus standpoint to say, hey, look, you know, we've got, you can use the belly space with the containerized uh, loading system, but it, it all really depends on the operators. I think most of the express freighters have no interest in that because for them it's a whole – it's different, right? It kind of it, – it, it takes away from their resources, so why why use it? Uh, yeah. But for some operators that have the ability to do that, yeah, it certainly adds some capabilities there. Um, but it's uh, – it, so it depends on who's who you're looking to, to operate for. I mean, the challenge, if you've got the containers topside, then what do you really need containers underneath for, right? They're not going to be standard. Um, I'm sure you can crossload it into like an ATR or something um, if you really had to. But that was the benefit of the LD3s on the on the wide bodies is to LD2s, LD3s, take them out of the belly of a 777 or a 7.6 and load them into an ATR and, and, and send that down line. But... You know, one of the other benefits, we talked about this with, with Ron Anderson, Garrix, the DC-8, right? Like, the DC-8 did not have containerized belly. Narrow body, beautiful top side. Uh, I can't remember, like, 18 positions, whatever it was, a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, on the 63, and, 73, yeah, that's true. Yeah, the 73, yeah. And the, um, the belly was all bulk load, which at DHL we loved. Because if we had what we called non-conveyable material, which is just stuff that couldn't go on the conveyor belt because it's too big or heavy, chances are it fit in the big containers on the top side. But for the stuff that didn't, you just jam it in the door. Like if it's a pole or like a, a drill bit or whatever, like the DCA, the, you just 
shove it in the the, the belly on a three twenty one containerized you you couldn't do that so you're you're limited on on your size to be even smaller um i i find that i find that a niche product at at best uh that 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 belly you know i mean it look on the on the passenger side too you've got benefits of the speed of of loading bags and and turn times and all that i i would assume so there's some benefit there but i always struggled with with how that would work in operation the the benefit of the containerized loading system for the A320 family uh, initially has been derived for uh, those operators who operate in very strict labor law markets like Northern Europe, Japan, Australia, for Qantas, just mm. to point out a few, where uh, ergonomic um, uh, issues for people loading and unloading aircraft are big, big uh, uh, regulatory regimes that have to be adhered to. So that it tends to make sense for them. But well, you um, have to have a K loader, and, or is there like a smaller version of a K loader that that, that accepts? Um, I believe it, it's the same loader that be used for like wide body main deck ops, right? And or wide body lower hold um, PMC operations, uh, lower hold pallets on uh, wide bodies. And, and so, so you mentioned the labor yeah. the labor side, which is really interesting um, because. You know, back this is from my Bombardier days. We did hear um, some operators that were uh, they gave a very strong preference to the seven three seven over the A three twenty family because their local labor laws or safety requirements did not require a baggage loader for the seven thirty seven because the the door sill was low enough that you could actually lift yeah. a bag and put it in there. Where the three twenty was was far too high, so you had to have that that additional equipment which is the the belt loader yeah though there there are pros and cons between the 737 a320 families i could go into but i might be viewed as partisan (laughs) on that discussion so i i recommend we don't go there (laughs) (laughs) so um so tom actually um you know you you've mentioned certainly kind of a trade and transport group uh a couple of times and obviously that's the company that you're you're with today. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit more about kind of what you know, what you guys do, what you guys focus on. You know, obviously the, I think the 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 main main part of it is looking at the cargo. But uh, we, you know, I'm sure our, our listeners would probably love to hear a little bit more about what you guys do. Um, you know, between you and Frederick. So I've only been with the company uh, right at. Uh, it'll soon be seven months. Uh, but I can say is um, I got to go to my first ISTAT event. Um, I was. I was never part of the ISTAT uh, aircraft traders crowd when I was at Boeing, which I, I kind of touched some people at trade shows. I met with some people, but not really. And now I find that um, um, I'm really, you know, I went to my first ISTAT event in March of this year uh, at ISTAT Americas in San Diego. And then I'm speaking at ISTAT uh, Freighter Forum, their first Freighter Forum here in Seattle uh, next month, September 2023. Um not putting a plug for ISTAT, but I, I find that uh, that working with the asset trading community has been part of our clientele, which is pretty cool. Uh, trying to understand the issues, and you know, with you know, one of the things we've been seeing is that air cargo traffic down, yields falling. Um, there are a lot of caveats in those two headlines. They they sell great copy online or in paper print form, um, but. Uh, Air cargo yields are still over 25, maybe pushing 30% higher than they were pre-COVID in the general freight market as of last week. And people say, oh, belly capacity is back. Mm, yeah, kind of. It's actually higher than it was pre-COVID. Is it in the places where it's needed? No. Case in point. And this is based on the research of uh, my former colleague at Boeing, Josh Collingwood, uh, who kindly shared with me uh, about a little over a month ago, a little less than a month ago, some charts that he's been doing fl- tracking flight radar 24 data, transpac market. Uh, Pre COVID, 60% of 62% of capacity over the transpac was um, on freighters. Uh, even with the recovery in some belly mar- passenger transport markets, that's only up to about 78%. I mean, it's, let me get this right it's still at 78%. So belly capacity is still not reattained. It's 
position on the Transpac, and this position is very similar between Europe and Asia. And a lot of this has to do with the opening of China, of China since the end of last year. But the problem is China is also backed Russia in the Russia-Ukraine war. And as a consequence, the Americans are not permitting PRC domiciled airlines to resume passenger service to the U.S. Yeah. Same for Canada. So we still have a heavy dependence on freighters. So it's it's pretty interesting. Um, and we're getting questions along those lines. So uh, Frederick and I did a couple of uh, studies on uh, developing world markets. The first one we worked on together was the Africa air cargo market uh, in February. And then uh, uh, Frederick did the 99% of the work on an India study um, that he put out in March. Um, but we also discovered after I went to ISTAT that there was a, an appetite for a near-term forecast um, on the freighter industry, which we built called the Freighter Market Outlook. And uh, that's led to a number of other engagements um, that we're following up on as we speak. So um, let's see what I to think about this. Uh, one was a consulting firm and a couple others are operators of freighter aircraft. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting, right? Because you're when, you know, in terms of, I would think where where your capabilities and your experience and expertise uh, comes into play is because I think a lot of folks now look at, you know, as, as an investor of, of aircraft, whether you're an airline, whether you're a lessor, whether you're just a, you know, kind of uh, straight investor into the space, you know, you look to see what are the all the different alternatives that you can use the airplane for, right? How can you basically extract all the possible revenue sources from an airplane so that you can actually kind of get as much life of the airplane as you can? And so I think that's where, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and we saw that obviously through in 2021 when all of a sudden, uh, because of the lack of demand on the passenger side, everybody kind of jumped into the, hey, let's convert our you know, 737-800s or A321s into freighters. And now, you know, it, it kind of, I think having known potentially the, I think that the the cyclicalities of the market maybe a little bit better, probably people would have gone, well, maybe we should have waited a little bit before we try to convert so many 737-800 freighters or 737-800s, uh, because now we have a little bit of saturation there. Now, I think long term, that's that's going to be fine. But, um, but you know, there is definitely more need for, I think, your level of expertise to kind of understand the nuances of the market so that you're not just using it all into one or, or, you know, kind of going to, to extremes. And, and, you know, I, I know having worked for less words in the past, you know, just kind of that thinking of, oh, well, you know, we, we can always, if we can't find a, if you can't lease the airplane to a passenger operator, you know, we can either a always convert it to freighter or we can always just part it out. And that statement is a bit too mm -hmm. generic and it's not always true. Right. But, you know, and that, I think that's where right. your expertise comes in to better understand that to make the right decisions. So when we started working on the freighter market outlook in earnest in late February, what we when we started to uncover, we were both of the mind that there's, oh, gosh, there's got to be massive overcapacity coming in, in the air cargo industry in terms of freighters. And then it became more nuanced. Um, and, yeah, the, I think the 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 primary example you talk about, uh, just to glam on what you're talking about there, Garrick, is 737-800 interest uh, for both the BCF, the SF, the BDSF from IAI. A um, lot of interest, maybe more than the market really needed at the time, but um, I have not seen or heard of any outright cancellations. Postponements or deferments, sure, but not outright uh, cancellations. Um, well, they can't... Not to mention... They can't deliver what they're the the conversion shops are having a hard time getting it through the the shop as well which which kind of yeah, works in the favor a little bit right and th there's a number of challenges not to mention um when you know people i, I remember a, a team of illustrious billionaire experts took out an op-ed piece and i think it was the wall street journal in the fourth quarter of 2020 saying that you know zooms MS Microsoft Teams, emphasis on Microsoft Teams, Cisco WebEx, we're going to replace business travel for the indefinite future. Uh -huh. And that air travel would never come back. Uh, I think we can all say that has not been the case. I have heard that business travel is still recovering, even in North America and your developing world, developed world markets. And I, uh, But I think if anybody's been on an airplane in 2023, 
Uh, there's no such thing as a spare room, spare seat in the house. Uh, they, they're yeah. very rare. They're very rare. And anyway, the the problem with that though is for the freighter industry, which depends heavily on feedstock from older but viable passenger aircraft, is that some of these airplanes that were earmarked for PDF conversion are now like, mm, mm-hmm. you know, I think I'm just going to do a cabin refresh because it's cheaper and puddle it out for another 72 to 84 months as a for the second tier operator. And in some cases, it might be a first-tier operator because Boeing and Airbus are still having supply chain issues getting narrow-body product into the market in the pack side. Same is true for the A330-300 or the triple, even the 777-300ER, which people had massively discounted during COVID. And guess what? Why cut a cargo door if you can repuddle the asset again for another five to seven, eight yeah. years? Yeah, so, and that's, I mean, yeah, that's fascinating. So these are a number of conundrums. Not, not that I don't want to see these aircraft modified. I, I, you know, more freighters are better in my book. But I will point out that when I uh, mentioned earlier that things are nuanced. Uh, Frederick and I are a firm agreement that there is undercapacity manifest in the large wide body, anything wide body freighter sector, anything that carries 80 metric tons of useful load or more. And that's the 747 in all variants, the MD-11 freighter, and the triple seven freighter at present, soon to be followed by the A three fifty freighter in a few years, as well as the triple seven eight F, as well as the three different conversion providers on the triple seven three hundred ER, and a lot of that under capacity that we, the industry hasn't grown that much, um, even during COVID. We are seeing a lot of triple seven interest. Uh, Boeing is still selling the original triple seven metal wing freighter. Um, they've just sold four um, to on a to multiple unidentified buyers in the June-July timeframe uh, per their orders update. So um, keep in mind that great stagnation that I mentioned earlier back in 2011, 2013, really turned off a number of airline boards to the revenue stream that is air cargo, especially amongst what we call combination carriers, passenger airlines whose primary mission is to move people, where they also in most cases have a wide body passenger fleet with ample lower hold capacity they need freighters for feed and defeed purposes and they've tried to minimize that and they're finding that that strategy probably wasn't the most prudent so yin and yang that there's kind of a catch-up phase we think going on right now in the large wide body sphere well and they did that after covid too right i mean air canada comes to mind with all their freighters and they have how many triple seven factory freighters still on the way um yeah, and, let's say two. That yeah, sounds right. I'm not sure. Which is a lot for Air Canada, right? Um, you know, and you know, who knows? Maybe, maybe the business was developed and the attention was was focused during COVID, and they feel they can they can do it going forward. But is this really the primary business of passenger carriers? Should it be? What does that then mean for the freight haulers? Um, you know, I mean. All that A330 transatlantic capacity, which was largely China-based, uh, isn't moving today. Well, it's moving, just not across the, the Pacific, uh, simply because of those those restrictions you were talking about. However, this is something that I'm looking about, kind of looking at for the next analysis. Have you looked at China-U.S. exports over the last year? Like... Makes yeah. 2008, 2009 look like a nothing burger compared to what's happening right now. So this is a fundamental shift in globalization. Um, maybe because they don't have the supply chains. Maybe the inventories are still out of whack, out of balance from the container ship uh, fiascos that we had where we would just move the bottleneck from Long Beach and then Shanghai and then back to Long Beach. Right. I don't have the uh, trade figures at hand, Courtney, but uh, Frederick tracks them fairly regularly and puts updates out on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. And what we have noticed is that China still remains the world's preeminent manufacturing leader. And uh, a lot of the trade spat is uh, between China and the United States. Mm -hmm. It started way back in 2018, I believe, under Trump, Um, has only really done is pushed a lot of trading partners of the U.S., to source kit from China, and then the the products which used to be come directly from China have some sort of minimal value added. There's actually an article in the Economist that was just published last Thursday on this very issue. It's actually strengthened supply chains connected to China so as to serve 
exports, uh, even including even the U.S. and Canada. Uh, Europe has been less so um, stringent in its um, use of trade as a tool with which to, uh, how should I say, communicate its displeasure with Chinese geopolitical policies. But um, still, the world is still very well connected, and um, there have been some blatant, egregious examples of where goods are shipped from China to, say, some Southeast Asian country. It's labeled made in that Southeast Asian country, and it lands in the U.S., but it really was just transiting. Um, we also, When I was at Boeing, we also noticed in 2019 and early 2020 that air trade between Canada and the U.S. started booming. And we had some suspicions as where the true origin of those goods were coming from, but we never mm. pinned it down because we didn't have that visibility. So it's um, – trade is – is definitely down because of the hangover from the supply chain when we were all trapped at home and buying a lot of kit online, blah, blah, blah. And there is a bit of a slowdown in manufacturing and, and freight transportation, to say the least. But um, uh, to say that things are all lost or as bad as they were as the global financial crisis 15 years ago, no, nowhere near. Yeah, no, nowhere. I'm talking the Chinese exports to the U.S. Yeah. is No, they're still fairly. Is down. Uh, I'm talking from year to year. I'm just talking against yeah. 22. Which again was actually it was it was it was on trend, but but anyway the well the point being the globalization trend um, that really was the past two decades is entering a, a new phase. I don't know what that new phase is to be fair, but it's 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 different the, now. The the term that I'm seeing used most frequently is called China plus one, where a lot of major multinationals are now sourcing continue to source from China, but they're hedging their bets by basically standing up manufacturing or alternative sourcing sites in places like Vietnam and mm -hmm. India, uh, which have been cited as the two primary beneficiaries of the trade spat between the U.S. and People's Republic of China. So um, how long this will go on is anybody's guess. Um, what is interesting is that uh, I remember when the Trump administration did put in place uh, the trade tariffs uh, in 2018, uh, there was speculation that if he was not reelected in 2020, that they would come off under a Democratic administration. They haven't. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So it's um, it is yeah. It's interesting. In fact, if anything, if if anything, uh, the restrictions have become much more pointed and much more targeted in certain industries. So, and, and that's uh, a really good read, I, if, I, if I may plug The Economist, which is one of my favorite reads. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, um, you know, the, so, and we've talked about this before, but the, the cargo market obviously is always viewed as a leading indicator of what's to come, right, in terms of whether it's a recession or now, do you think that that still holds true or have things changed enough where, you know, you have to pay attention to other things now to, to, cause it, if that was the case, right, then we would think that with the slowdown in the cargo market that there is a slowdown in the passenger market that's coming. Um, but, you know, I think as you pointed out, you know, the, the air freight rates are still uh, higher than where they were in 2019. So is it is the slowdown just purely based on this, the spike that we had? And so now we're getting back to some normalcy or is there I don't know, I'd love to get your, your take on that, you know, because it's certainly something that over my career, I've always been told, look, you know, cargo has always been the leading indicator. And so keep an eye on that because then the passenger gets hit. Uh, passenger bar gets hit after that. So it's, it's, but if, I, it feels like it's changing, but I'm not sure if I'm correct or not. It's mixed. Uh, and if it is a leading indicator, it's not by a lot. Um, and I, I would like to think that it, it, in my personal opinion, I think that the markets are fairly decoupled now between passenger and freight transportation and commercial air transport. Um, uh, I, it is, it's very tenuous at best to say it's a leading indicator. Although you, when supply chain, when demand patterns do recover, they tend to recover with such an abruptness that supply chain managers are caught flat-footed and air freight starts to boom. Um, but, um, and, and it's, it's extremely volatile. And what's also interesting is that over the course of any given year, there is actually two peak seasons uh, for air cargo on a global scale. And you can see this like in IOTA statistics. Uh, they, there's a time series of data put out by Jesper Venema 
of IATA, which I'm a big fan of, which I don't have access to at present, but I did in my former career, um, that looks at the 10 kilometers of goods moved by their constituent IATA carriers. And so, sure enough, September, October are big months, um, or even into early, mid-November uh, for air cargo. But sometimes the peak is actually bigger in March in, in a given calendar mm. year. Let me explain why. Lunar New Year, celebrated by a lot of people in East Asia, mainly China, uh, that most people think about, um, is usually in the January, February time frame. Also, uh, a lot of Asian firms, are their fiscal year is based on an April 1st to March 31st time frame. So with a lot of their manufacturing workforce idle for two weeks or better um, during Lunar New Year holidays, and then there's this crunch to get manufactured goods, plus there's a I, I like to think of it as people get their credit cards paid off from, you know, the, the holiday season, Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, you name it, uh, in the no, uh, November uh, Diwali, the November, December time frame, they start to buy goods again in the Northern Hemisphere spring months. And so all of a sudden there's like this bow wave of air cargo moved in March. And I think a lot of it actually has to do with Asian firms trying to get uh, inventory onto their customers' books where they can claim a receivable on the positive side in their ledger. Yeah, but like you know this from 25 years at Boeing, that's exactly what you do. Dece how many airplanes are delivered on December 31st or that week, right? Same thing, or right? December, the inventory. Yeah, yeah. yeah MS is the same thing, yeah. right? All of a sudden it's kind of like, oh, we've delivered 5,000 yeah. airplanes in December. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, oh, and the rest of the year? Eh, like 25. Eh, all right. <laughs> But it's yeah. a, it's an yeah. inventory, it's accounting, it's getting the cash on the books. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, manufacturers have to accommodate uh, uh, the culture of their workforce. And that's in East Asia, that's a big one. Yeah. No. So I, I did have a, a question in terms of, um, actually, I have, to have two things, which I, which are, are interesting to me. But um, so now you're, you're talking about the, the wide body side, uh, you know, the wide body freighter side and how. You know, there's definitely kind of a, a shortage on the capacity side because of some of the retirements of the older stuff, which makes perfect sense. Um, but, you know, do you think that we will get to the point where, as you have now, you know, three companies going into the, the 777 converted freighter, you've got Airbus going into the A350 freighter, um, you've got, you know, Boeing that's going to be out with the 777-8 uh, freighter, I believe, right? Um, or the, the 777 freighter. Mm -hmm. um, and so will, you know, in the latter half of this decade, it, you know, are we going to go into now all of a sudden over over capacity because everybody seems to be kind of going into that side of the market, seeing opportunities? Or or do you think there's enough retirement um, at play that it'll be able to just, you know, kind of soak up whatever capacity comes in as it should? So... Whenever there is a downturn in freight transportation, relatively speaking, what happens is the least efficient capacity is pushed out. And even if there's like, quote unquote, overcapacity of a newer type, it's more efficient, has a longer active life ahead of it, um, that it will remain in place. Case in point, uh, FedEx and UPS have both announced that uh, they're drawing down their MD-11 freighters. UPS hasn't put a time frame on it, but... FedEx has said they want their MD-11 fleet gone by fiscal year 2028, memory serves me right. And they just announced that in April. So um, a year ago, there were about 110, 115 active MD-11 freighters in the world. Or I just checked Syrian fleets uh, today, and it's down to about 85. So, um, and there's only three operators. There's, again, uh, FedEx, UPS, and Western Global, all U.S.-based. So, and that, that fleet is 100 out of about 600 large wide body freighters. You also have a lot of 747-400s. Mm -hmm. um, we think the 47-400 conversions may be the next type that is lesser efficient. Uh, the factory freighters uh, on the 400 series probably will just witness diminished utilization over time. They, they're, they're re, their retirements will be prolongated by just wearing out green time on engines and that sort of thing because they're, they're yeah. just unique with yeah. the, the nose door and everything and what they can do. There's nothing else out there like them. And um, that that was, I, I have, full disclosure, I'm, I'm a big fan of everything 747, but so I'm a bit biased. But the 777 um, freighter is built today. Uh, 
is almost a hundred is almost the same capacity, like maybe four tons shy of what the four seven mm. classic was and the four seven two hundred. Plus, it's got fifty percent more range, um, so it's a very useful, very versatile tool. And um, the um, A three fifty and the triple seven eight F also are vying for quote unquote being the seven four seven four hundred replacement, and mm-hmm. we're watching. Very ra- with rapt attention as how that that really unfolds over yep. time. So, but that again, um, will there be overcapacity in the back half of this decade? No, I, I don't think so. I really don't. The market will correct itself. So, case in point, I go back to like 2006. The, the predominant type in the large wide body sector was the 47 Classic. There were about 170, I think, in service in the peak season, the fourth quarter peak season of 2006. Uh, 47200 is built roughly between 1970 and two, uh, 1991 uh, that were either factory built triple seven or excuse me seven four sevens or conversions by uh 2012 2013 there were less than 30 operating worldwide so that 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 fleet got hammered just because there were 400s coming along online Triple seven, the first triple seven freighters were coming online. The first seven four seven eights were coming online. There was just no room at the end for those yeah. types, mm-hmm. especially when fuel, Did, especially when jet, or I should say, yeah, uh, oil hit one hundred and forty seven dollars a barrel in July two thousand eight. Did you notice a consolidation of carriers during this time, or or, or of of heavy operators, heavy lift operators during this time, or how does that market? L- yeah, look today to compared to what it was. Just looking at the U.S. market, there were probably um, 17 large wide-body freighter operators um, on based on U.S. soil, and I think that wow. number is now down to about 11. I um, couldn't. I couldn't name three. Right. Well, yeah, if you FedEx, take out FedEx UPS, right? Um, Atlas, Atlas, Kalita, Western oh, Global. Kalita is still around. That's right. Western Sky Global, Lease. kinda. Right, they just they're filed. still in business. Yeah, they're still in business. Um, which other ones? Sorry, you used to have like Tower Air, and uh, we got um. Does Tower Omni ne- do Tower never Tower never had freighters, but Atlas. Okay. Um, Polar, which Polar. is actually under the Atlas umbrella. Um, mm-hmm. Kalita in in Michigan. Um, Skylease, out of Florida. Mm. I believe they they've got either one or two seven four seven four hundreds. They were once known as Centurion, but I, I think they retired that name. Oh, that's right. Um, yeah. Well, then you got like ATSG and A Star. I don't even know if they're still around. Yes, they are. Um, but ATSG uh, only has medium wide bodies and standard body aircraft, as I understand it. Um, they do operate through their Omni AOC triple seven PAX airplanes uh, in the charter market specifically in support of the civil reserve air fleet mm. uh, to a, that's one of their mar- that's one of their key customers sure um all right here here's another question for you um when you think about so what you know obviously airbus looking to get into more of this freighter space they've got the, the a321 conversion they've got the a330 conversion uh now they've got the a350 freighter um <clears throat> do you see them going into the a330 neo uh and offering that as a freighter, um, based on their hopefully lessons learned from their stint on the A330-200 factory freighter? Um, or, uh, you know, what, what do you think about that in terms of that space? It's it's definitely a wild card. I'll put it that way. Because um, I, when I was at Boeing, I did hear industry rumors that the 330neo was being scoped, um, uh, which is understandable. They should uh, as a as an OEM, um, having left Boeing in the last seven months and had more conversations with Airbus, uh, they will not be drawn on the subject. So <laughs> it's, which you got to understand that, um, there's a couple things. It's, it's, it's a moving target for them as it is Boeing. So Boeing, um, with the 767 300 freighter and the triple seven metal wing freighter as built today, they can no longer build according to ICAO Cape. Mm-hmm. environmental regulations after December yeah. 31st, 2027, less than five years from now. Right. However, um, Boeing leadership was on record in press briefings prior to Le Bourget this summer, or 
this northern hemisphere summer. Sorry, Frederick. Uh, June of uh, this uh, June 2023 is saying that they are exploring exemptions for the 767-300 freighter uh, beyond that date. So um, they also said that the log- logical successor to the 767 would be the 787 as a production freighter. Um, so I th- might. I think it's fair to say that Airbus is probably watching to see what Air, what Boeing is mm-hmm. going to do and how they time. And they, they're all cap, both OEMs are capital constrained on what they can tackle right now. Yep. And they've got bigger fish in front of them. So on the large wide body side, the 777 metal wing freighter is our, its natural successor will be the 777 8F. Plus you've got ample conversions of 300 ERs and 200 LRs in the pipeline as well. So the, the thing, though, is none of the conversion programs have their STC yet. I We speculate that all three will probably be get their their STCs next year uh, at the earliest. It may drag on longer because, again, um, FAA and EASA, just, um, they're resource constrained yeah. just like everybody else. Okay, so let's do a, a, a scenario here, a, a hypothetical. So if, if you were told... Um, Let's play appraiser. So think, think made up Let's numbers. Think okay? made up if you were, if you were on the, in, the aircraft investment side and you were looking to acquire an aircraft, a freighter aircraft right now, what do you think has the most upside? Uh, which, which aircraft type has the most upside to it looking forward? I, I'm talking kind of currently in service. One of the uh, okay, I've thrown my bias out there uh, to a degree, but I'm a big fan of the seven six. It's a very versatile tool. Do you still think it has freighter. it has more upside to go? Yeah, the conversion programs are still going, but the problem is the feedstock is getting older and dwindling. Right. And some of the biggest operators, since they don't have a replacement in the pipeline from either OEM that they really like, are probably not going to let go of some of those airplanes, and that's that's kind of it's kind of constrained. So, but medium wide bodies are very versatile and as i mentioned earlier there's a lot of upside potential for e-commerce network growth in the developing world that's not been tapped yet it's got a lot of lot of potential left to to for for extrinsic growth and oh and 76 is um a very versatile airplane it's a wide body but uh, has many of the attributes of a standard body or narrow body product okay uh, perfect segue cost than bigger airplanes because this leads Lower into my next question. Bigger airplanes. Yeah. Because uh, now this wasn't planned. This is off off the off the cuff, Garrick. This is <laughs> time on wing ad lib. Um, but the seven from the context of the seven six three, we'll consider it converted. Let's assume that there's speed stock for what for what uh, a carrier uh, wants the aircraft for. What is the case to choose? say a 321 or a 738 over a 763 how do those comparisons start to affect each other like at what point really what i'm getting to at what point is the 763 the narrow body Mm -hmm. freighter of choice well it's it's a wide body and let's let's, horses for courses it's gauge it has lower unit costs simply because of its scale seven six um freighter whether it be a uh, II beta conversion or a Boeing conversion or a Boeing factory built 76300 from Everett, Washington, um, carries roughly 52 metric revenue tons of payload. That's uh, gross. It's like closer to 55, 56, depending on mm-hmm. the max zero fuel weight and the OEW involved. Uh, 737 conversion on the 800 is like a, roughly a 23, 24 metric ton machine, net payload, net revenue payload. Uh, a three twenty one a bit more at like twenty seven metric tons, so it's it, the it's like it's like comparing a Ford F one fifty to a you know full tractor trailer. Yeah, both are trucks, but guess which has got the lower unit costs. Um, but if I'm an operator, a trip, but but which has a higher trip cost, right? Yeah, and therefore some more risk. But um, I this, and Courtney, this again, you you have to keep in mind that the freight industry is built on scale, and um. Um, I, it's funny, I used to support a number of sales teams at, at Little OEM in Seattle, and they would come running to me. Well, they wouldn't come running, but they would call me up and say, hey, I, 
tell my, I got a customer and they want to get into cargo, but they want to do it in a really mild way. They want to, they want to start out, they want to start out very cautiously with a, a small freighter. And I'm like, okay, what markets they want to serve. And then I said, I started painting the analogy of Bambi versus Godzilla. Yeah, you can take a 737 across the Pacific Ocean, but you'll, mm -hmm. you're, you'll eat your hat because you're flying against equipment that's much more lower unit cost, like large wide body freighters. I once had um, a head of cargo department tell me that his DC-1030 freighters flying over the Pacific were much more economically liable than 747 freighters. And he was out of a job 18 months later. Simply, simply because of the volume. The unit costs um, are, are key. Sure. Uh, but the problem is freighters you have to have, again, it's you got to be you got to be chasing the market at all times and, and being willing to, to make alliances uh, in, in freighter ops that you may not have necessarily thought of in a previous life. Um, for example, uh, Kalita, uh, 747 400 operator, now flying 777s. But how do they do that? A uh, big part of their business, somewhere I'm going to say between 30 and 50% of their flying is on behalf of DHL. It yeah, wasn't the and case that... 15 years ago. When I think about this from the operator standpoint, I start to struggle. Look, the so the 738, well, very solid freighter. It has a great track record. It is It has created and proven a market. Mm -hmm. If I'm an express carrier, great. I have a continuous, you know, volume of goods flowing through. If I'm e-commerce, like I know I can align that to to the volumes that I need. Um, but if I'm parking an airplane in Miami and doing some freight forwarding business and whatever, I'm foregoing some business if I don't have wide body topside capabilities. And how much of that does it require before I'm before I'm doing it? I'm thinking of ASL in Europe, right? Great, you know they're they're perfectly fit for the mm -hmm. for the express market. For ASL does DHL or FedEx? I can't remember. They, they serve um, they all the major express carriers. Yeah, okay. Um, but if I'm if I'm a freight operator working in this space, and by the way, you know, even to the context of like, I, you know, I think UPS and FedEx are outside, have grown outside of that market as well, right? These were mm -hmm. these were seven two seven one hundred operators, two hundred operators. Now the smallest airplane that they're sourcing is the seven six, right? They sell the seven fives, uh, which are amazing freight haulers as well. But of course not being built, um, you know, at, at what point do I, as a, as an operator in the cargo market, just be like, look, I need something in that 25 ton range, but damn, if I'm not going to let, you know, a 50 ton job go by the wayside because I don't have the, the capacity for it, given, given the availability, the pricing and the, uh, just the, um, the, the, the capabilities of the seven six. Th that's really kind of the the direction that I'm I'm considering with that. Well, again, the Courtney, the you have to keep in mind that capacity risk is very real, and that sure. demand might be there for fifty tons today, but it may not be there tomorrow. So that's why, if beyond these big names, um, you also have a lot of smaller players that are not household names in the freighter industry. They're not. Mm -hmm. I, I struggle to keep up with all the names, and I'm I'm I've got my nose in CH Aviation's website every day, as does Frederick and other resources, and I'm I'm learning new freighter names all the time, and they often are um, mercenaries, uh, or that basically work with the bigger names like DHL, FedEx, UPS, yeah. but primarily DHL. You know, there's this acronym uh, OPA in finance, other people's or OPM, um, other people's money in finance. The DHL has a term called OPA, other people's yeah. aircraft. That's how they mitigate their risk. And so you have to keep in mind, capacity risk is very real. And you always have to be looking over your shoulder. You have to be looking over the hill. Um, cargo and freighter ops in general require very aggressive and professional sales teams. And mm -hmm. the success uh, or failure of any one given carrier is often dependent on very key relationship or a, hand, a relationship or a handful of relationships. And if you have um, a no need of, you know, if you have a, a customer one day, you have to be able to redeploy an asset to another customer in a different part of the world very, very quickly. Atlas is arguably very successful in that realm. ATSG, um, mm -hmm. 
also successful in that realm. Um, ASL, successful in that sphere. They have to be. Uh, Kalita, um, they they work the ACMI market very, very hard. And there you have it, folks. Courtney is wrong. Yeah. There you have it. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know what we call that? No. We call that Wednesday. Yeah, try it. Just another um, day. Yeah, I still, I still yeah. really struggle with the three twenty one. Like it's a great airplane, it's it's very capable, but why not just spend a little bit more? I mean, the airplane's expensive, yeah, and it's, I mean, because it's, it's a great passenger expensive. hauler, yeah. right? So it's gotten more expensive. Just take the seven six. It's and it costs more, but man, I, you know, I, I, unless you're Indigo, great, like perfect. If you're a three twenty operator, these are the these are the types of things I, I, I think about like. You know, um, if you've got DHL signed up on the express side as, you know, if you're doing ACMI work, perfect, great. Um, but I'm really interested, maybe this is an analysis I'll look at, like just, you know, operating cost, all in costs. Again, the seven sixes aren't really available to there's there's that, but all in cost, you know, what's the value of just having that seven six available so you can you're not turning away the heavy lift bit well, heavy <clears throat> medium lift business when it comes. It, Kind of interested in looking at that, actually. So, you know, the 321 is being heavily marketed by EFW and Precision as a 757 freighter replacement. Um, and tube-wise, it's about the same size. Sure, buy that. It The wing box and the gear, um, the engines, does, doesn't have the, the same payload range capability. But in looking at how 757 freighters are operated, there is a bit of validity what, to what the EFW and Precision are claiming, to be fair. Uh, typical 757 in domestic U.S. operation is probably hauling around 18 to 20 metric tons. So, And that's within the realm of what an A321 can carry. I think the um, challenge there, though, is that's binary. It's only UPS and FedEx, right? Uh, or the, the or DHL. Yeah, or there's SF some European. China, or Amazon. Uh, yeah, so, <clears throat> yeah. I mean, Amazon has, yeah, I, I could totally see Amazon doing that. Their attention is just more on the wide yeah. body side now. 37800, however, um, is a smaller airplane, lower trip costs, and also is capable of carrying those same 757 loads, average loads, not volumetrically, but it, yeah, it, it it's can, a little shorter. Yeah. Weight, Matt, yeah, it is. To interesting. Be Very interesting. Yeah. The good news for freighter operators, there's a heck of a lot of choice, a lot more choice than there was, say, five, ten years ago in uh, the different gauges of equipment, which is a good news story because when you have more more capacity providers chasing that market, that tends to engender more competition. Mm -hmm. That lowers costs in the Keynesian economic theory, and the industry grows. And my old cargo forecast at Boeing have more chance of being right than wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, that's that's your own fault for staying at Boeing long enough to see your own forecast come to yeah. fruition. Normally, like, yeah, you <laughs> you set your. In fact, we'll have a guest on the Time of Wing podcast here in a couple of weeks um, who coined the term. Um, you know, I, I set he sets his uh, retirement date by the the end of his forecast. So he just makes sure he retires before that. Because he <laughs> can never be proven wrong, right? Ah, I'm out of there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, there was an old adage. Uh, give them a date and give them a number, but never give them both at the yeah. same time. There you go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, you know, and I mean, I think it that's where it makes sense. It makes a lot of sense to look at 20-year forecasts because a lot of things can happen in 20 years. And so you can, you know, you can you can throw a lot of stuff in there. And at some point you can be like, well, you know what? We were right here and here. And, you know, but things changed over there. So, which, I mean, that's just the way it works, no. right? It's, it's just the business of forecasting, uh, you know, but you're, you're trying your best based on yeah. what you know, what you think is going to happen. But, uh, you know, and I do the same thing on the valuation side, right? You try to figure out how things are going to be. And, you know, sometimes you get it right. And a lot of times you get it wrong because you didn't realize something else was going to happen. So that's just part of it. So, but you know. uh, <clears throat> Tom, this has been really, really great. Uh, so we, we definitely appreciate your time yeah, today. Great. And kind of sharing your your thoughts and your experiences, you know, in the industry. Um, certainly wish you the best with uh, you know with Trade and Transport Group going forward. You know, you guys are, are doing thank great you. stuff, so I'm sure that'll continue. But uh, definitely want to thank you for for taking the time today. 